Well, good evening. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in tonight uh, for our live uh, stream from Foot Innovate. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about the entire lineup of surgical solutions for bunion deformities uh, from the Crossroads Extremity System. And, and whether you have a mild or moderate bunion, severe bunion, or if you have uh, a bunion where there's hypermobile medial column or an arthritic bunion, uh, Crossroads has a surgical solution for you that is uh, simple and easy to use, very reproducible, and also very efficient and time-saving. So tonight, what we want to do on our on our agenda here is just briefly introduce uh, the the two systems: the Dyna Bunion system and the Mini Bunion system. Then talk about an algorithm. Uh, then we're going to introduce our esteemed faculty to go through some case reviews, and then we'll get on to a panel discussion. Uh, of some different topics, and then hopefully, time permitting, have some questions and answers. So to introduce the system, um, I want to introduce the Dynabunion, the 4D minimal incision lapidus system. Um, and we'll get into what we mean by 4D, but it, as you know, with any lapidus that we do, it's important that we fully correct the deformity. And in order to do that, we need to think of all the different planes of correction. So first of all, we have our transverse plane, and that's where we're getting rid of uh, our, you know, reducing and paralyzing our IM angle. Uh, the next thing we want to do is on the frontal plane is to reduce the sesamoids and get them underneath the metatarsal head. And then lastly, we want to make sure that we realign our sagittal, sagittal alignment. Um, you know, some other systems that are out there can be, there can be a lot of complexity in doing this and also take a lot of time to make sure that you get it right. And the great thing about this system is it's simple and stress-free. And as I mentioned, it's, it's very reproducible. So when we, we think about these three different things that we wanna correct, one thing we absolutely do not wanna forget is really the, the fourth dimension. And the fourth dimension being compression. If you think back 10 to 15 years ago when uh, we first had anatomic plates come out for first NTP fusions, um, a lot of those plates basically had locking features and were very anatomic, which was great, but they provided no compression. And a lot of studies showed that these plates initially created non-unions. They were non-union creators. So anytime you're doing a fusion or a fracture, you have to have some element of compression uh, that's going to enable healing. So that's where we get the concept of this, this 40 element uh, of the uh, Dynabunya system. And then we basically, once we've done all of our correction, we get this, all of our correction in this area, we get this 4D rack block that helps to start the compression for us and finalizes our alignment as we then get ready to put on our construct, uh, which is most commonly gonna be here on the right, the, the staple compression plate. And the beauty of this system is that, you know, what, you know, if you don't use something that's dynamic, whatever compression you get in the operating room is what you get. But with a system like this, using dynamic compression with the staple, you are going to continue to get compression even after you leave the operating room, which I think is a huge advantage of this system. All right, so when we talk about the surgical technique, we're going to talk about the four C's. We'll talk about our initial cut, which will be the distal part of the metatarsal. We'll then do our correction of our different alignments that we discussed. Then we'll do our proximal cut, and then we'll go on to the compression. So when we talk about the four C's, that is what we mean in our surgical technique. So now we'll move on to our video here. You can see that our incision is uh, really kind of dorsal and medial, about 45 degrees from the, the, the exact dorsum of the foot. Our incision is roughly going to be between three to five to four centimeters. Uh, and then we're basically getting into the first TMT. And then we want to put in our jig. Uh, initially, we'll get uh, our fixation distally, which we want to be bicortical. Uh, once we've had an opportunity to do that, we will go ahead and uh, put in our saw. And we're basically taking a minimal cut, in this case, just of the uh, proximal metatarsal. Once we do that, we flip our jig. Um, and then basically, that's going to help us to correct our alignment here, our rotational alignment. We'll go ahead and get the distal portion of our jig here in place. Uh, that'll go over the second metatarsal from a small incision, and then we'll basically put it into the first metatarsal only. You want to check that and make sure that you're not putting it into the second metatarsal. And then you're going to dial in your transverse correction, uh, making sure um, uh, that you do the windless uh, mechanism here. So you're dorsiflexing the toe. Um, and then basically we're going to put our fixation in proximally to help hold this in position. 
uh, and then we're cutting now the proximal part of the cuneiform. Again, a very small cut that's helping us to get our correction. Um, and once we remove that piece, if we need to, can we have the option to recut it if necessary. And then we're putting on our compression block in this area, which is gonna hold everything once we've corrected all the planes and then get the, the right compression that we want. Uh, then we can get some final films to make sure we're happy with all of this. We'll place some more provisional fixation. I would recommend doing a wire freehand uh, just to make sure you're maintaining all of your position. Um, and then once you have that, you're ready to take off the block. Uh, and then you can go ahead and do your, your fixation. Uh, and here's just a couple of ways of doing it. Uh, there is a plate bender for a contour, although I will say I've never had to use that. It always seems to fit very nicely in this uh, uh, dorsal medial uh, positioning. First thing we'll do is put on um, basically holding it in position. We'll go ahead and drill our staple. Uh, once our staple's in position, uh, we'll go ahead, it goes in very easily. Uh, once it's in position, we'll then go ahead and uh, finalize our positioning uh, uh, with the guide. Um, and then we'll go ahead and put in our, our screws on uh, the remaining aspect of the plate. And typically these should be uh, non-locking screws uh, that you're gonna put uh, so that you're gonna make sure that this uh, is still gonna be dynamizable uh, for the standpoint of the staple that's in place. Uh, you can see that they are also can be polyaxial if needed uh, when you're putting them in and they come in sizes of 3.0 and 3.5. Once we have our complete construct in position, uh, the next thing that we're gonna do is a go, put, uh, go ahead and use this guide uh, that will help us to find um, uh, our, uh, our, our bolts basically. So this is just putting in the final screws here. And once we have those in, in place, and as I mentioned, it's, you know, it's important to do all of these non-lockers um, and you get all of them into position. You can try to do uh, bicortical and then you wanna do our anti-drift placement. Uh, so this is our anti-drift bolt and you can see approximately where you want this to be going uh, into the uh, base of the second metatarsal. Um, a lot of times, you know, you wanna check this on C-arm uh, and then you're putting your screw. And again, you wanna try to get this to be bi bicortical if you can. And this is typically what the final construct is gonna look like. Uh, and once again, you're doing the 4D, uh, uh, 4D um, alignment through this where you're getting all the planes and then finally getting excellent compression. So the next thing we wanna get into and introduce is the mini bunion 3D system. Um, and basically, you know, there's, there's a lot of buzz about minimally invasive surgery. Uh, I think it's here to stay and it's not going to go away. Uh, it's in, in my community, there's a lot of people that are doing it, uh, which there's some good results. Uh, there's also some very bad results. And for me, getting into minimally invasive surgery, it's something that I want to be ahead of the curve. I don't want to be behind the curve. And, and let's face it, our patients nowadays are extremely savvy. They're coming in. They're, they're getting, they're doing their homework, whether it's in Google University or whatever, but they're, they're doing their homework and they're coming in and they're asking for these kind of procedures. Um, and the thing that's great about that is the simplicity of the system, again, being able to reproduce and the efficiency of the system and getting the correction is, is just incredible. So if we want to say what's really new with the mini bunion, uh, there's two things. There's the capital fragment control guide. It's called the Viking ship. As you can tell, it looks like a Viking ship but it's very helpful in just maintaining the positioning uh, as you're finishing up and getting in, uh, getting in your instrumentation. And then there's this precision osteotomy guide, uh, which is very nice as well. Initially, uh, when this was launched, we, we were gonna have it with a burr. I think this is much easier. You can get a nice, uh, excellent cut uh, that's very easy. Uh, and the guide helps you to do that um, if needed. Um, and it, and it you know, basically stays away from using a burr, which can burn the bone. So let's get into our animation here for the mini bunion. For first thing with your technique, you wanna consider putting the foot up, um, you know, basically so it's perpendicular. Uh, you really wanna take your time to get these CRM views first to make sure that you're in line with the first metatarsal shaft and then draw out your line. You don't wanna do this quickly. You wanna make sure that you really have good views. Next, you wanna draw a line intersecting the dorsal, per dorsal perpendicular of the line of the MTP joint. 
Then what you want to do is come back and basically draw a perpendicular to the flare, the proximal flare of the metatarsal head. And once you have all of those things in place, then basically what you want to do is put a wire 90 degrees to the long axis and along with these lines. And once you have that in good position and you're, and you're helpful, it's important to get a lateral x-ray and make sure that you're in the middle of the bone. Then you can make a small 1.5 to two centimeter incision uh, and then get you down in position. Uh, this is an implant that helps you decide the length of, of the arm of the implant if you would like. And then you get your guide in position um, once you have that, you can put in your provisional wires here. You want to make sure that you bend those back out of the way. And then once you do that, uh, we can also get our Viking ship in position that you'll put in the capital fragment, uh, which will help you again to maintain that position. And then we'll go ahead and make our bony cut. Once we do that, you are able to correct rotation uh, with this procedure, as you can see. The next thing we'll do is we'll load the implant. Um, if you want, you can use the, uh, this, the suture technique uh, if you want to tighten up the capsule. So that is something that you can utilize. Uh, this is basically using a freer to, to use the start hold that you're going to use to do um, put your implant intermedullary in uh, the first metatarsal canal. Once you have this implanted, you'll be able to basically slide the implant in position. You can use this uh, mallet uh, with a hammer to just put it back down in position. And then you want to make sure that you have it seated. So you're basically uh, just, um, just around the, uh, the top part uh, of the implant so that you have, uh, you're able to see the screw holes without any difficulty. Following this, we go ahead and do the, the distal really of the two uh, using the oblique hole in the implant. Um, you'll go ahead and put your wire. It's easily measurable. Uh, and this is a 2.0 reamer. Uh, you do want to make sure that you get it by cortical. And you go ahead and place your 2.7 non-locking screw. And you want to just get this barely tight. You don't want to over, over tighten it. The next thing that we'll do is go back and basically get the Viking in position. And this is where we're able to manipulate the capital fragment in the right position in all planes but we also can control the rotation of the sesamoids as well. Once we are happy with that alignment uh, and we put the proximal fixation in the Viking, that will hold and maintain our alignment. And then we can use our locking screw that goes into the capital fragment uh, placed through the uh, distal part uh, of the implant. And this will advance uh, until it's locked all the way down in position. And then your, your distal oblique or your proximal oblique, oblique screw, you can go ahead and tighten that down and then get your final correction. And as mentioned, if you, if you want to, you can go ahead and uh, use this suture loop uh, to basically uh, uh, reapproximate your capsule if you feel that that's necessary in the procedure. All right, and so here's an, an algorithm that uh, may be helpful for some of you. Um, basically, when you when you get into mild to moderate deformity, uh, that might be more of a case uh, for somebody to do a mini bunion procedure. More severe deformities may be a, a, for the Dyna bunion or more of a lapidus kind of a construct, and particularly if there's an unstable medial column. And then obviously, if you have an arthritic bunion, that's where you're gonna be getting into doing the first MTP fusion. But it'll be interesting to hear from our panel and, and how they utilize, what algorithm they utilize uh, in their decision-making uh, for bunions. So we'll go ahead and move on to our first uh, case um, uh, roundtable review with uh, Dr. Mike Campbell. Mike, you have the con. Thanks, Terry. Great introduction and uh, nice overview of everything. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, talking about one of my things that's near and dear to my heart. I love doing uh, uh, bunions um, and uh, I do uh, both of these procedures routinely. Um, I would agree with that algorithm. Um, I think the most fun thing to do when we're talking about these types of things, is just show cases and, and kind of hear a bunch of different people, what they would do, what they would say. So uh, here's a patient. Um, 68 year old female that uh, came to my office, um, having foot pain, failed non-operative management, severe bilateral bunion, hammer toe deformities, osteopenic bone quality. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a hint, I operated on both of these. Um, 
what do you guys think? You guys want to, uh, uh, Craig, you want to take a crack? Tell me what you think. How would you address this? Um, <clears throat> from a pure x-ray standpoint, you can see a lot of diastasis back at the Los Franks region. Um, so immediately based on that, the severity of the deformity, um, I'm thinking Dynabunion. Uh, osteopenia, her age group, um, you know, I check her vitamin D level, make sure I felt comfortable that she would have a you know, good uh, healing response from a fusion technique. Um, so I think you could do dealer's choice here, but as long as I felt comfortable with her post-op and her uh, healing, I would go Dynabunion. Okay, yeah, I think uh, uh, exactly type of things I always look at. One of the things I'm, I'm huge on is um, I always kind of grab the, the foot and I sort of shuck, I call it the shuck test, I don't know. Uh, and my, my fellowship director gave it that, I don't know if that's a real thing or uh, something that he just made up, but you know, kind of grab that medial column and stress that TMT joint um, and, you know, if it's all over the place or if the person has a collapsing arch, I think that's a great indication to jumping into a lapidus. Um, and uh, that's what I did on this patient. Um, Brad, you're, you're super aggressive at doing mini bunion. Would you, would you think about a mini bunion on this? Yes, I would, uh, Mike. I definitely would. The one, one thing I look at is, of course, in the sagittal weight-bearing lateral images, um, I'm not seeing a lot of sagittal plane deformity in that you know, medial column. Um, I don't doubt that there's hypermobility there, but maybe more in the transverse plane hypermobility. So, um, you know, I, I look at some of these patients and, you know, they've had bunions for years. They just want it fixed and they're looking for, you know, fitting into shoes a little bit better and a straighter toe. They're not looking for perfect. So sometimes I will discuss with them, well, hey, maybe the mini bunions for them, it's a smaller incision. They can walk right away you know, maybe it's a little bit less involved of a procedure and um, might be something I, I, I've tried and done this successfully in some of these types of patients. Uh, and I've, uh, the patients have been very happy as long as they kind of understand, you know, how, the direction I'm taking them. But I do have this full discussion with them. And the one thing that worries me is just the osteopenia for both procedures, just, you know, getting good fixation and, and good, getting good healing. Yeah, yeah, certainly the, uh, uh, not, you're not going to be dealing with the best bone in a patient like this, but it's, it's what you got. So, um, so this is what I did. Um, obviously I staged them. Um, the, uh, the left side I did first, um, that was with the, uh, the Dino Bunyan, uh, cut guides with the older plate, because, uh, at that point in time, the Dino Bunyan plates weren't approved at my institution. This, the, uh, the one on the right is the new Dino Bunyan specific plate. Um, that was the one I did more recently. Um, you can see she's got some pretty ugly second metatarsal phalangeal joints. On the left foot, it was painful. On the right foot, it wasn't painful. So I actually intentionally neglected it. Um, I'm going to see over here if I can play this video. I don't know if you guys can see this video playing, but um, this is her walking. I took this video in my office. She was three months and six days post-op on the right side. Um, in that video. So for, you know, six, at this point, 69 or 70 year old lady, um, uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good outcome and everything like that. Got a nice correction. Um, one of the things you'll see on both of these is Aikens. Um, I don't know what you guys think. Maybe it'd be interesting to kind of go down the line. Um, do you do a lot of Aikens? Uh, do you not do a lot of Aikens? What's your, what's your indication? Terry, do you want to uh, hit that up first? Yeah, um, I, I do a fair amount of Aikens. I think, you know, I think it's once you've, and these are excellent corrections, by the way, um, you. you know, once, once you've finished your, your big procedure, um, you know, I don't want to use the word cosmetic in any way, shape or form, but if certainly if they have any intraphalangeus, I'm going to do an Aiken. But the other thing is, it's just kind of looking at my correction, you know, my, um, I am angle might be great, but if their big toes kind of very close to the second toe, then, you know, if I think about a lot, then I'm going to, I'm going to do an Aiken. Um, so I would say I probably do it in 30% uh, of cases. What about you, Craig? Yeah, I would uh, agree with Terry. Um, I have a pretty low threshold to do an Aiken if I think it's going to improve their long-term outcome. Uh, the toe's not right where I want it. Um, and I'll actually do an Aiken 
before I would consider doing a lateral release. Um, lateral release is my very last option. I wanna uh, do my best not to touch those soft tissues and give them a stiff toe. Yeah, I, I, uh, I try to avoid the lateral release if I can. I, you know, in my experience, I find that it's very, very often age-related, older folks, you know, you much get, doesn't seem that old anymore, but you get much over 40, 45, and uh, that, that, you know, the toe and everything's not quite as flexible. And uh, I definitely think as age goes up, um, I'm a huge Aiken guy. I love doing Aikens. I, I think it helps. And actually, one of the things is I always dorsiflex them. I kind of do the old the Mo Aiken or it's a combination of a Moberg osteotomy plus an Aiken. Patients, my older patients with softer bone. Oh, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, my older patients with softer bone. I, uh, uh, I, I, I always make sure the anti-drift bolt is bicortical like Terry showed in that uh, video. And then the other thing is I'll, I'll throw one of the screws across the medial interconeiform joint. I don't prepare the majority of the medial interconeiform joint, just the, the distal end of it but I still put the screw across. I haven't had any issues with that backing out. Um, and I think it gives better stability and better healing. So, and nobody look at the second MTPJ. It looks horrible, but it doesn't hurt and the toe's straight. You can see in the pictures. So that's a win in this lady. The left side actually has a cartiva. If you notice that little lucency there, she did have a painful one there, so. All right, so a little bit of a different animal here. Uh, younger patient, mid 40s, um, painful bunion, difficulty with shoe wear. Um, what do you guys think? Craig, you wanna hit it up first? So assuming no comorbidities and whatnot. I think this is also dealer's choice. I could sell myself on doing either procedure if the patient doesn't give me a reason not to do a lapidus, um, but I'd be perfectly comfortable doing a mini bunion on her. I, I don't know if that's a full weight bearing x-ray. Her sesamoids look quite distal. Uh, so maybe she's got some increased forefoot declination. And so um, either procedure, we could tweak the position of the head and the sesamoids. Um, she's definitely got that curvature to the hallux itself. So maybe a, a mini with an Aiken. Brad, what do you think? Yeah, I'm thinking that the first metatarsal looks a little short in general. Just, uh, I know it's like Craig said, maybe the x-ray view, but, uh, I'm, I'm thinking mini, um, and I think it's maybe rotational, the, the hallux. So I may not think of an Aiken. I'm, I'm not as big proponent of Aikens as you all are discussing. I like to do the balancing soft tissue first. And then if I still feel I need it, I do it. Or I do agree that if it's a more chronic, um, kind of more non-reducible or semi-reducible hallux where you can't quite get it reduced, I would do the uh, Aiken for that, you know, more of those chronic bunions. But yeah, I'm thinking definitely a mini bunion and see where we go from there. All right. So I was kind of on the fence on this one. Um, did a uh, uh, Dino Bunyan on this one. Here's another case. Um, this was a uh, IMA about 20 degrees, um, pretty significant sesamoid on coverage, um, no comorbidities. Um, what do you guys think? Any, uh, any thoughts? How's, uh, how's the motion of the first MTP? Looks like there could be a little of arthritis. It, it moves pretty well, but I'll tell you, it's, um, this is something that I always struggle with because it's kind of incongruent. So it's, you know, it's like saying my dislocated shoulder really moves nicely. Um, and, uh, you know, so what's going to happen when you straighten it out? That's always a, a good question, I think. But in this case, it moved pretty well. In my hands, this is a Dino Bunyan every day. Yeah, I th I, you know, you, you definitely could consider a distal procedure depending on the age of the patient. Usually, uh, as mentioned before, if they're kind of that plus 60 or so, sometimes I discuss with them about, you know, just kind of fixing it, you know, most of the way. 
Um, and if it is reducible, that first MPJ, then I, I think it's reasonable. But if it's not reducible, uh, I'm thinking uh, fusion or, you know, some sort of, uh, um, you know, proximal procedure possibly. Uh, I guess it would depend on the, the, where the level of pain is and some of the other factors, you know, biomechanical factors. Yep. Well, so this was a young patient. She was absolutely hell bent on an MIS surgery. And I said, well, it's a little bit uh, pushing the envelope, but um, this is one where I, I, I did a pretty uh, uh, aggressive shift there. Um, this is not normally the way I would do it. I, I, I would agree with what you guys were saying. This is typically something that I would do a lapidus on, but um, it was uh, it was one of these, this is really, really, really what she wanted. And uh, kind of one of those ones where if I didn't do it, she was going to go somewhere else. One of the things I'd say too is, is a little bit interesting is um, the, uh, the Aiken, um, uh, the, now a lot of times I do these, I, you can see there on the uh, clinical picture on the left side of the screen, uh, small open incision. Now a lot of times I'll do these MIS um, with uh, two little poke holes, which is kind of nice, um, nice little trick in conjunction uh, uh, with the uh, with the mini bunion. Um, I, I like the mini bunion too, as opposed to the 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 other MIS ones with screws, where you end up making all these poke holes all over the foot. I kind of have, I think it's kind of neater and cleaner to have one small incision than you add the length of my mini bunion incision to the poke holes. I think actually it's probably smaller. So she had a bunionette too that I did as well at the same time. So, um, so anyway, and you can see over there a clinical picture of her, um, you know, what it looks like, her using the foot and uh, she's back at the gym and, and loves it. And it's, it's, this was a, uh, this is a little bit older. Um, this is before I was doing the, the, uh, the MIS Aikens and, and stuff. So uh, it stood the test of time nicely. So I went off my algorithm because, because uh, uh, Terry, that algorithm that you showed at the beginning, I agree with hundred percent and I tend to follow that pretty closely. Um, but uh, sometimes they, you got to give them what they want. Mike, I think that looks great. You can see the remodeling, you know, of the regenerate bone from the, you know, stretching of that periosteum laterally. That looks great. And then also you can see even the medial remodeling a little bit too. So it's a great long-term uh, x-ray that really shows excellent results. So yeah, it's a, it, you, you uh, I, I was leaving the OR holding my breath on this one and stuff. And, uh, and, and, and I did, I did, I kind of, I did the ache and I did the, um, I used the, uh, suture to applicate the capsule. I made sure I got a good frontal pain, plane correction. Um, and I was pretty aggressive with her weight bearing. I let her walk on it right away. Um, it was stable and, and stuff. And uh, I don't know, I think sometimes that may actually help the, the, uh, the consolidate and the regenerate grow faster. So, um, so as crazy as this one looks, I think if you can weight bear this one, the, the, and the reason I showed this is if you can weight bear this one right away, you can weight bear, I think any of the mini bunions right away. All right, I'm going to pass it off now. I think uh, Craig is up. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, for taking some uh, time out to spend the evening with us. Hopefully, uh, you'll take home some uh, valid info to help with your day to day practice. Um, whoops. So 58 year old white female comes in bunion consultation, um, kind of gave it away. But if you look at the AP and you see uh, the arrow I put there, um, really demonstrates uh, what kind of diastasis you can see with uh, uh, these Hallett's valgus deformities. Um, anyone here would do a mini bunion on that? Dr. Lamb? Uh, yeah, no, that worries me too, Craig. I, I hear you loud and clear and probably clinically you're feeling it as well. How about you, Dr. Campbell? Probably not. I think, uh, yeah, I would agree. Terry? I would probably lean towards uh, a Dyna Bunyan seeing that and uh, and then also clinically, if there's any hypermobility, I would I would probably lean more towards a dynabunion on this one. Yeah, I, I think my algorithm has evolved to. I'm probably more in a position of 
give me a reason not to do a dynabunion. Um, her lateral x-ray doesn't really show this point that I want to make, but you'll see this a lot in your practices if you look for it. A lot of these patients with bunion deformities will demonstrate some medial faulting, some you know, uh, medial sag. Um, and when we do these lapidus procedures, you have the power of uh, translating that first metatarsal a little plantarly. Um, but just by fusing it and adding stability, you can really improve a lot of, of those foot alignment uh, angles that we talk about, like the lateral Mary's angle and so forth. So here's a Dyna Bunyan. Um, this is uh, an oblique proximal phalangeal osteotomy that um, Mike Cohen published and taught when I did residency there. Uh, it's kind of like a reverse while from dorsal proximal to distal plantar. And I choose it over the Aiken uh, just real quick because you can cut it, move the toe, put a K wire in, take an X-ray and put the toe exactly where you want it, drop another K wire and then start swapping them for the two screws. And you can really dial it in perfectly. Um, so I think we got good correction there. We got a congruous joint, good sesamoids. We can see some nice uh, bone bridging and um, uh, this is the uh, one I did very recently, but you can see um, a fully threaded screw there. Craig, can you go back uh, to your uh, post up there? Can you and Mike talk about the length of the staple? You know, what, what's your feelings on that? I, uh, I try to get it a little bit longer if I can, but any comments or concerns there? So the most common staple I've used historically has been 18, 18, 18. Um, they came out more recently with the 18, 18, 14. And I've been using that just kind of as an experiment because sometimes the proximal can be uh, interarticular or close to it at the cuneiform. I can't say I know of any patient who's complained about that, um, but it's more of kind of my own just trial and errors. But um, as a rule, whether it's uh, Dyna Bunyan, first NP, second TNT, um, I wanna try and get um, my staples on the longer than shorter side and grab as much bone as I can. I'm a, so, so I'm a big fan of the 18, 18, 14 staple. Um, at this point in time, pretty much for me, if it's a, um, a female with a you know, regular to smaller sized foot, I pretty much opened that one right off the bat. Um, the 18 leg is never too long for the first metatarsal, even in the smallest patient. Um, and like you said, I, I think uh, I, the thing I worry about really for me is not so much violating the medial intercuneiform joint with that limb of the staple, but what I worry a little bit about is if it would, if it would alter the biomechanics of how it works, um, if it's not pulling just on the medial cuneiform and it's starting to grab the middle cuneiform. So um, for me, that's the reason why I want to make sure that my staple is only in the cuneiform. Um, that being said, um, you know, I think I had said earlier, but I'm not afraid to take one of those more proximal screws that you see there um, and run it across. Typically, I do the most proximal screw and I'll run that into the, uh, into the intermediate cuneiform if there's osteoporotic bone quality just for a little extra stability. Yeah, that's a great point, Mike. Um, something I'll also point out just caught my eye. If you look at my most distal screw, it doesn't look like it's bicortical. Um, but depending on the anatomy, the distal hole on that plate is going to sit a little more plantar. And so this screw is actually coming out more plantar lateral than directly lateral. So on an oblique x-ray, you'll see that it's bicortical. You can always take a C-arm with your depth gauge just to check that. Um, but when you get an AP, sometimes it'll look like you came up a little bit short. That's a good point. It's a the other thing too, if you, hey, can you go back to that slide for one sec, Craig? One of the things that I think looks really good is if you look where that anti-drift bolt going from the base of the first metatarsal into the second metatarsal is, it looks like you've got a nice preparation and some graft in between the bases of the uh, metatarsals and the base of the cuneiform and the second metatarsal. And I always, when I'm doing these, I try to get a little spot weld in that area. Um, I think it's real easy to prep that through the joint when you have it open and distracted. So that's kind of the, uh, one of the things that I shoot for. Um, and, and, you know, once you get that, your IM is not opening back up and those screws aren't going to back up or anything, which is a, a common concern that people sometimes 
raised with putting a screw between the uh, the metatarsal bases. I think that's yeah. a huge, a very important point. I, I completely agree. I try to get that, get the fusion in that uh, spot weld in that area as well. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And um, my little trick, if you want to call it that, but when I've got um, my my two pins in the first met, um, and I'm taking away the sliver on the met base, I take a pituitary rongeur, pull out any tissue there, make sure it's all bone, I didn't leave anything behind, and then I'll actually start nipping away a little bit at that second met base and uh, denude some of that cortical bone to bleeding to help promote that spot fusion. I think it adds tremendous long-term stability. So we go to uh, my second case. Um, you can see a 48 year old white female, a uh, good range of motion, um, not a terribly large bunion, very healthy, very active athletic patient. And um, uh, lateral view, she's got you know pretty good alignment, uh, no real significant uh, uh, pathology or sagittal faulting going on with her. Um, how about you, Terry, what would you do? You know, as long as there's no hypermobility of the medial ray, which um, certainly there doesn't appear to be any of those characteristics on the x-ray, I, I would, uh, you know, go more towards the mini bunion here. Brad? Yes, I agree. Yeah, mini bunion all the way for me. How about you, Mike? Yeah, she's going to love that. <laughs> so if you remember my earlier comment uh, I've evolved to say all right what's in your medical record or your exam that's going to say why I shouldn't do a dino bunion so we could talk a long time about that philosophy but um, I would say in general I have such reliable results with this, I firmly believe I'm giving my patient the best chance of a one-time lifelong correction. Uh, I'm helping overall foot mechanics. Uh, I'm not taking a straight bone and making it crooked, you know, all those things you've heard before. Uh, what I really like about this one, and this is one of those ones where you just go home happy, uh, no matter what happened during the day. This was her six-week post-op. This was an x-ray from last week, and this is a six-week Lapidus, who came in uh, wearing sneakers uh, from her gait, uh, which I wasn't smart enough to video. You couldn't tell which foot was operated on. Dying to get back in the gym and exercise. Zero swelling, zero pain. Um, so I zoomed in, as you can see on the right there, and you can just see all that bone laying down at six weeks. Um, so, you know, for me, this is a, a home run and uh, she is absolutely ecstatic. Any comments? No, it looks great. I mean, you know, if, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, whatever's re most reproducible in your hands, you know, even though we all said mini bunion, this is a great correction and the patient's happy and that's what matters. I think, you know, I think one thing that's interesting is if I showed this to some of my colleagues in town, they would comment on it you know, the, the first metatarsal is shorter. And um, if there's one thing that I've noticed over the years, I do, I do less and less and less metatarsal shortening. And I don't know how you guys feel, but I really think if you keep that first metatarsal plantar flexed and you put it in an appropriate position and you don't let it dorsiflex, then you don't have to start shortening up all the other metatarsals. Um, and you make it such a simpler procedure and such a simpler recovery. And, and uh, I think this is a case in point to that. Yeah. That's a great point, Mike. And I, you know, anecdotally, I can tell you, um, well, one, I always translate my first met slightly planner on the pineal form. When I'm putting the rack block on, I'll put a mini homan under the first met base because that rack block is so strong as you slide it down, you can inadvertently get too much sagittal translation. So you really got to watch that. I'll put my finger and feel that little step, make sure it's not more than a couple of three millimeters. Um, so I think I'm offsetting some mild shortening by some mild plantar translation and knock on wood, I really have not seen one single case of transfer metatarsalgia after one of my lapidus by doing that. So I'm sure they're out there. Uh, I don't know if I've been lucky, but um, that's worked for me. 
I think a good little technical pearl is, is um, one of the key steps in Dynabunion is when you're putting those wires into the cuneiform, you've cut um, the, the metatarsal and you, you have your correction done with your rotation and your IM. Um, when you put those pins in, um, you want to make sure that you have your metatarsal, I think, uh, for me at least, in the right position um, in, in the sagittal plane. So it's, it's you know, it's not dorsiflexed. Um, and that minimizes, uh, in, you know, the amount that you need to plantarly translate the entire metatarsal and move it down. Um, but, um, and, and, and yeah, but I, I, I have a whole series like this that I could show you of, you know, what look like long metatarsals and there's no transfer lesion because the first metatarsal is stable and appropriately positioned. I should have one more in here, Scott. You skip it. I think I had yours in the middle of mine there. That There was one that I kind of jumped through uh, quick. All right. Well, I skipped right. one by accident. All right. I guess I keep giving them away, so <laughs> no mysteries. So again, why would I not do a Dino Bunyan on this lady? Her shoulders are crap. Her hips are arthritic. She's got a bad back. I'm thinking her balance isn't good. Her vitamin D is not high. Am I going to put her in a boot for six weeks, worry about her offloading the first two weeks? Um, so um, I kind of gave it away, of course, but um, this is a lady that certainly has a big enough deformity if you want to go old school, uh, but I don't look at lapidus based on degree of deformity, obviously. Um, but this is one that with all of her comorbidities, I want to make her foot not hurt, but make her risk for complications as low as I can manage and make her life during her recovery as manageable as possible. Surgical sandal, not a boot, uh, immediate weight bearing uh, without a major assisted device. What do you guys think? Start with you, Mike. Well, um, so I weight bear either of these immediately. Um, so, so for me, that's not the, the end all be all. Um, if that first metatarsal phalangeal joint moves reasonably as crazy as this, this might be one that I would do a mini bunion on. One of the things, one of my, my, my partner, Blake Moore taught me is sometimes older folks, it's a nice, easy procedure, um, and, uh, a little bit easier on their old foot. Um, so, um, I might consider that on this one. How about you, Brad? Yeah, so I think if the hallux reduces, you know, you can get it back centered on the metatarsal head if it's, you know, kind of flexible. Uh, I would agree with Mike. I would, I would lean due to her age uh, to the distal procedure. Um, I'm not, I'm not weight bearing my Dyna Bunyan lapiduses quite as much as you all uh, at the moment, but I think, um, I think she'd just be a perfect candidate for kind of a simple mini bunion in my, in my hands. How about you, Tara? Well, I'd, I'd want to make sure that, you know, she has decent motion in the first MTP and that there's no mid-arc mid -arc pain. If there was, I'd do a first MTP fusion. Uh, but just based on her x-rays and, you know, obviously not doing her exam, you know, one thing that, you know, I th is really important that I've instituted with these is I'm getting sesamoid views all the time. Uh, any bunion yeah. patients, you know, so I get an idea, are they reduced, are they not reduced, how much rotation, and and sometimes in seeing arthritis in a patient of this age, even in the sesamoids, then I'm still thinking potentially a first MTP fusion, but just, you know, I agree with everything you guys are saying, but I would probably err more on doing a, um, the uh, Dyna Bunion on this one. So something I think is important to point out, I and mean, we obviously can see that floating second toe. We know she's got plantar plate tear insufficiency, um, long second met. Um, and a lot of these patients that we see, and I'm sure you guys will agree, they're very often just coming in complaining of their second rate pathology. And you go, oh, by the way, I've got to fix your bunion because there's nowhere to bring that second toe down. You're walking on your big toe. Um, and uh, so this lady certainly had a lot of that where on the AP, you can see how much overlap she has there, crossover toe, and, uh, you know, was getting a painful corn where the toes were rubbing together. Um, not this case, but I did one the other day, uh, an older patient, more arthritic, 
uh, first MP, first time I tried it, and I'll see how it goes before I share the x-rays, but um, I did a mini and then did a mini Keller um, and just really decompressed the joint, got it really moving nice, had a lot of capsule to sew, got rid of the arthritis, and uh, hopefully that'll work out. So um, here's my, uh, my mini uh, for my Halix osteotomy, my while with a crossroads twist off screw, my second hammer toe for the planter plate repair using the crossroads strop. Um, I would say some pretty aggressive translation um, if you're not Dr. Lamb. Um, uh, K-wire in the hallux is really because I didn't feel warm and fuzzy after putting those two screws in, didn't like the bite. So I just put the K-wire in just to sleep a little better at night until she throws down some bone callus there. What do you think, Terry? No, I think it's fine. I mean, I think I think you've you've achieved your goals, and uh, so I, I think it all looks good. And you know, once everything's reduced, the sesamoids are aligned. Her joint really looks great. What and do you I'm think, sure, Brad? I'm sure when she's healed, she'll love how much motion she has. Brad? Yeah, I think that's yeah, it's impressive. I like it. I think um, the bone will fill in, and uh, what I've done with kind of these older patients, keep them in the surgical shoe a bit longer than. Uh, the younger ones just to kind of make sure that the the bone starts to consolidate just because it's a bigger translation but I, I think it's a great realignment good case yeah thanks so as far as the surgical shoe if i've got um k wires in the toe or let's say i just did number two um i'd have her in a surgical sandal for six weeks because that's my my time to pull the pin so i agree with that keep them in a rigid sole until you're happy, swelling's gone, pain's gone, x-rays look good. What do you think, Mike? That's crazy, but it looks good. Her foot, I mean, if you look at the shadow of her foot, it looks normal. Yeah, and this is immediate post-op. Um, I, I just did this, so she's got quite a bit of medial soft tissue swelling and redundant soft tissue and capsule there. So um, I'm confident at six weeks, she's gonna get you know a lot of uh, remodeling of the soft tissues and reduction of uh, edema. Thanks guys. Those are my cases. Hey, Dr. Breslar, if you don't mind me asking real quick, um, was that, were you doing freehand cuts or using the, the cut guides for that? Uh, which case? For uh, this one. Oh, for the mini bunion? Uh, that's a freehand cut. Um, I, when I'm working with my fellow, I'm using the, the cut guide. And uh, he was at another case that day, so I did a freehand. I'll run the one K wire and I'll just run the saw. Um, but most of the time we're using uh, the cut guide. Um, very, I've very shown, clean, uh, you know, we, okay. we've gone through the variations with the original guides and um, I think the new cut guide is, is great because it's just even quicker and more simple. Great. Okay, so let's see. All right, so I'm up next as a 47 year old female, bunion for 10 years, waited for surgery because uh, she's heard such horror stories from her aunt about uh, her previous, uh, you know, surgery. And so you can see the clinical picture on the left is sagittal plane imaging, and then of course. Uh, you know, quite a, a decent amount of IM angle there uh, between first and second. So, um, Terry, you want to give it a go? What do you think? She doesn't really have clinical hypermobility that I'm feeling. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I can pretty much guess what, what you probably did here, uh, and I'm sure it's going to look great. But uh, for me, based on the, you know, how much deformity there is, um, I would probably lean towards uh, the dining bunion on this one. Okay, just because of the higher IM angle, you're saying, Terry? Yes, and 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 the other thing is just probably how much the toes pronated, and how much those sesamoids are, ro are rotated. So you know, as I mentioned, I'm I'm getting those sesamoid views all the time, and and you know, um, I, I think you know how much they're they're rotated is is important to me. Now, having said that, as we said before, you know. I think that with the thing with the mini bunion is you can, you know, you can still derotate the sesamoids very easily. 
Yeah, Terry, what do you think comparing the Dyna Bunyan versus the Mini Bunyan? How much rotation distally do you have to do versus proximally? Do you think it's the same or do you think it's less when you're doing a Mini Bunyan with the rotation that you have to do? I think as far as getting your sesamoids, as long as there is no significant arthritis, I think that I think you can correct the sesamoids pretty equally. Just, just if we're just talking about that rotational plane. Yeah, I guess my question is, uh, I feel, I don't know, uh, that when I'm rotating the distal osteotomy, I have to do less derotation distally than I would if I was uh, doing my proximal dynabunion, just in general. I don't know what your feelings are. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say um, there may be some truth to that. What do you think, Mike? What's your thoughts on this case? So, um, so for me, um, this would be pushing the envelope for what I would be comfortable doing a distal procedure with, um, largely based on what the clinical radio, the clinical picture looks like. And as crazy as it is, that's often what I hang my hat on. Um, if it, if it, you know, if I'm kind of on the fence x-ray wise, I look at the foot and if the foot looks bad, I lean, I go more proximal. If it, if it doesn't look as bad as the x-rays kind of lead me to believe, then I'm more likely to do a distal. Um, one of the things I, I would be a little bit worried about looking at this is the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. Um, it looks like maybe it might be the borderline of a little incongruent. Um, and uh, I, I, Brad, do you ever do your, do you, do you ever have to do a distal soft tissue procedure with your mini bunion? Uh, are you saying lateral release or what? what yeah, like a lateral release or anything. Yeah, so I, I commonly, am doing a, a percutaneous you know lateral release through the web space and i'm commonly tightening the medial capsule so that's pretty common for me to do both uh, with my mini bunions yeah so interesting so maybe i need to add that to my algorithm but typically for me when i get to that point i i uh, I, I jump more proximal so i would i would probably do a proximal with this great you know, lapidus yep Good, good. Craig, any, uh, any thoughts? Yeah, so I'm looking at, um, you know, 47 years old. Um, when I was young, that sounded old. Now I'm older than that. So that sounds really young. So um, I've had too many patients that came back that I did distal procedures on 20 years ago and thought I hit it out of the park. And maybe they came back for heel pain, but I got to see the bunion again and it's coming back. So that's really my largest impetus to take the extra time and work and, and do the Dyna Bunyan um, if I think it's in the best interest of the patient long term. Uh, if you switch the numbers and she's 74, uh, you know, she's got, you know, uh, that age against her, I, I would certainly push the envelope of the, of the mini Bunyan and stay away from the fusion. But at 47, uh, I'm doing the Dyna. Gotcha. All right, so I did, uh, you can see uh, distal, the mini bunion. Um, I basically got a you know, pretty good shift, um, uh, the translation and a little bit of rotation. So I definitely uh, felt like I got a pretty good correction and I did my soft tissue rebalancing, as I mentioned. Um, and you can see a pretty long implant that really, I think holds stability in the in the canal there and so she was extremely happy you know very little pain post-op and I think that's one of the the highlights that really impresses me and impresses the patients about this procedure how little pain they have you know one or two pain pills at the most sometimes and they're they're able to move their great toe joint post-op you know week one or whatever uh without pain and um, you can see the clinical picture on the left. I did do some percutaneous capsulotomies and, uh, she was loving the results. Um, and how, long so, do you, how, how often do you use the long implant? I feel like I, I rarely use that. Um, um, do you use that a fair amount? Yeah. Great question. She was, you know, kind of a, almost a six foot tall woman. So, you know, pretty big foot in general. So uh, I agree with you 100%, mostly the short implant, but this one's the long one, which gives you a little bit more uh, sticking power in that uh, kind of cortical uh, base there, which it gets pretty dense proximal. So I think this definitely helps with the stability 
in addition to the screws. And I think, you know, um, the cases presented earlier, you know, the, this implant is crazy strong uh, if it's implanted appropriately, which, you know, I think that allows for, you know, uh, less swelling, quicker healing, less pain, and, um, you know, uh, kind of that regenerate bone formation laterally, which, which you're seeing on this case as well. I think it's immediate post-op one month and then maybe two months or three months is the final image on the right. Brad, can you talk briefly um, as, as far as your decision-making on how much offset to pick in the mini bunion implant and then looking at your medial shelf proximally, uh, was that a power rasp or rangeur? What'd you do there? Yeah, good question. So the, uh, yeah, the width of the implant, I've kind of um, looked at that for a while. My, the original design was the wider the implant then the more translation you can get because it kind of pushes the capital fragment more lateral. Um, but I found that, you know, depending on how you insert the implant, you can pull the implant with that oblique screw or, or push it over pretty far lateral. So uh, the width of the implant, uh, I've been using mainly the 3.5 width, not the 4.5 width in general. And uh, I still feel like I can get good correction and I don't need that extra metal in, in the foot. Um, but I am very cognizant of how much translation, because the original idea is if you have this, you know, large, um, you know, the sesamoid sticking out of the lateral side of the metatarsal, the idea is, okay, well, if it's five millimeters, you know, lateral to the first metatarsal, the fibular sesamoid, well, if I put a five millimeter implant in, it's going to, you know, do that uh, closing or realignment of the sesamoid. I mean, that was kind of the original thought, more of a transverse plane thought. And, um, but it, you know, definitely holds true. But with the rotation, uh, I think you need a little bit less translation sometimes. Um, just depending on, on the case. And then I'll use a saw on the medial um, proximal shaft here. I just take a, I use a kind of a wider bunion blade for the osteotomy, but I use a thinner kind of hammer toe type blade for the medial bump. And I'll just go right kind of parallel with the medial foot. And I'll just take that bump off that medial aspect. And I find that when I didn't do that originally in my uh, initial cases, uh, patients were having pain. And I thought it was originally the hardware pain, but it was really that 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 shelf on the medial shaft of the first metatarsal. So I think when I trim that down, it's it's made a big difference for uh, how people feel about the you know just the the thickness over there on that medial aspect. So, but yeah, uh, this patient I know I did a medial reefing, and then I do a percutaneous like sixty four beaver blade through the just the lateral capsule. I don't do a anything more than the lateral capsule, the first MPJ, so. All right, uh, we'll go on to the next one, 48 year female, she's very active. She's got hallux valgus and definitely some hypermobility when I'm feeling her uh, first ray and a little bit of this metaductus foot. Um, not the, you know, not, not an easy case when you get this metaductus involved. So uh, Mike, Take a stab at it. What do you What are you thinking when you see this X ray, and what What's your thoughts on on this particular options? Well, number one, I'm glad she's down in West Palm Beach and not Virginia Beach, because um, uh, metaductus is always, you know, I always find it a challenging thing. Um, a lot of times, you get a real, um, for lack of a better term, a wonky looking foot clinically, um, and they want you to get rid of their bunion and you know, it looks like a huge bunion, but there's not a whole lot of intermetatarsal angle or, or intermetatarsal distance between one and two to close down. So, um, you know, so then, so then you, you know, you start talking about, you know, multiple metatarsal osteotomies or multiple TMT fusions and stuff like that. So, um, but that being said, looking at this one, you've got a little bit of space to play with. It's not a huge IM. Um, there's a pretty significant uh, hallux valgus angle, you know, 33 degrees for an 8.9 millimeter IM is, is certainly impressive. Um, this, this would be one, I, I, think a, I think a mini bunion would be a, a pretty nice uh, choice potentially for, um, you know, the goal I think with this one is try to make the bump go away and try to get the toe straight. Um, and uh, I think that's how I would, I would approach this. Uh, yeah, Mike, so I, I guess I forgot one little tidbit that'll help you too is um, 
he was it's um an active male and he was having some midfoot pain in that liz frank not the first liz frank but the kind of second, second and third yeah okay and i missed that i had my no, no, uh, i didn't i didn't tell you that originally but i i think that kind of can change the the thinking wouldn't you say absolutely so 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 if that's the case then i mean really what you're talking about is an unstable medial column that's overloading the middle column um and um and it's i think it's pretty common if you look at these meta metaductus feet to start seeing first uh, second third tmt arthritis so in that case then i think you need a a, a procedure to stabilize and plantar flex the medial column and probably the best way to do that then is with dynabunion um and then the question is do you have to do anything to the other metatarsals or is simply offloading going to make it better so um and i would definitely on this one um i mean i think this just looking at this, this is going to need a distal soft tissue procedure um and uh and also the uh uh, the Paul Giuliano Memorial Aiken. Dr. J always taught me to do those, so I would do an Aiken. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Well, for time's sake, I'll just uh, show you the results here. Let's see if we can. Uh... Yeah, so I did uh, a, because he did have uh, pretty good arthritis of that second mat cuneiform joint. So I fused that with a staple and also did a Dyna Bunyan. Uh, I got nice rotation. I've, I feel good positioning. And uh, he was able to weight bear pretty early. I kind of uh, kept him down and out for about a month and then let him start putting some weight on it in the cam boot. Um, and uh, yeah, he did real well. Uh, and he's real active now, but uh, went pretty long on that, that um, screw between the first and second met to really make sure I got good control over there and did what you all had uh, recommended, that kind of inner cuneiform debridement inner first metatarsal debridement just to kind of get uh, get it locked down. So uh, yeah, this made sense to me. I, I was, uh, he kind of came in asking for the mini bunion and believe it or not, uh, I uh, I did the Dyna bunion, but I think this just shows, you know, I'm, I'm opposite of Craig. I, I do a mini bunion. You got to talk me out of the mini bunion and because he had arthritis, uh, that's what talked me out of it. So I'm kind of opposite of Craig. And I think that's the beauty of the two systems. So I'll turn it back over to Terry at this point. All right. I'm just waiting to get, uh, there we go. So uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, go through, go past my cases here. I'm not able to advance there. I'm going to go ahead and, and kind of go uh, blow through my cases and get to our panel discussion. We have about five minutes left or so. So um, let me just ask a couple of questions and we'll start with Mike. So Mike, what, you know, I think we already know what your algorithm is, but um, you know, what, what are some caveats that you have to to your algorithm that we may have not already covered? Um, so I think a couple of things, I think, um, uh, one of the things I always look at is the patient, uh, do they have a flat foot or are they developing a flat foot? Um, that's something that I think tends to push me towards doing the lapidus as sort of a medial column stabilization procedure. Um, one of the things uh, I always think is important to look at is, is you know, what's the heel cord like? What's the gastroc like? Um, I try to avoid doing a gastroc recession if I can. Um, I really do think that's one of the things, you know, non-operative management for a big bunion I don't think there is very good non-operative management besides telling someone to move to Hawaii and never wear shoes. But I do think in some of those patients, you can stretch out their heel cord pre-op. Um, and I use this thing called a pro stretch. Um, it's this little plastic device you stand on, you lock out your knee. It does a real nice job of stretching the gastroc. That might be a little pearl that um, might help someone. Um, and, and then you can save the, uh, the gastroc recession. Um, and, and really more than anything, that, that allows me to speed their weight bearing. If I do a gastroc recession, I got to keep them locked up a little bit longer. Anybody else uh, um, from our faculty have anything else to add from their algorithm? I'm, gonna no, take... I think I'm, I'm good, Terry. Yeah, I think we covered most of this. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's go on as far as adjunct procedures. We've we already talked about gastroc and, and Aikens and and, um, you know, I, I will say from my standpoint, um, in doing the, the um, you know, obviously the, the mini bunion, I think one of the great things about that is 
I'm, I'm not having to do very much with the capsule and it's great because it, it, it basically, they have incredible motion and patients love that. When it comes to doing lateral releases with the Dynabunion, uh, I'm fine that I, you know, when, since I'm getting the sesamoids reduced in many, many cases, I'm doing a lateral release less and less. Um, and, you know, I, I, I will say that I do a, an Aiken maybe, uh, you know, about 30% of the time. Uh, what about the rest of the panel? as far as doing lateral releases and, uh, and that kind of a thing? I, uh, I try to avoid it if I can personally. I, I do my cuts, I loosen up the joint, um, I swing it over um, and, and then I check the x-ray. And if it looks like the sesamoids when I correct the metatarsal rotation or, or correcting, I don't do it. Um, uh, Cause I, I think they, I, I just think the recovery is nicer and, e and easier and the, the uh, the one little pearl too is if you're going to do your lateral release, maybe cheat your incision a little bit. If you're doing Dynabunion a little bit laterally, that way you can use the same incision for your uh, reducer between one and two. Anybody now, I would else? say um, I do everything I can to avoid cutting the soft tissues. If I have to do a lateral release, which would be my last resort, um, I'll follow uh, Brad's technique and I do a little stab incision, perk it with a beaver blade. Um, we didn't talk about the medial eminence. You know, we know we rotate the dorsal bone medially when we get a bunion, we rotate it back. Um, but if they still have a little bit of a residual medial eminence after I'm done with my lapidus, um, in order to save the soft tissues, I'll make a stab incision with a beaver blade, I'll undermine with a freer and I'll put in a power rasp and just do a little MIS exostectomy there till it's nice and smooth and round. Um, it's very rare that I'm doing a gastroc uh, with a bunion unless I'm doing other things to address uh, collapsing flat foot, you know, so Taylor instability, things like that. How about you, Brad? Yeah, so I think um, just to answer the question, uh, I, like I said, I do mostly little percutaneous lateral release and then the medial uh, application through the implant there. I use like an ovicral suture and uh, I've been very pleased with it. I haven't had, you know, 250 cases of mini bunny and really, you know, anecdotally, uh, uh, you know, I haven't seen any significant decrease in motion in the cases I'm doing more aggressively this or less aggressively. So I think uh, it doesn't stiffen it up is, is my comment on that, um, but I do think it kind of balances it out. And I would say with uh, my either a Dynabunion or mini bunny, and I, I do sometimes open up just a mini open incision to take some of the, the bump off that dorsal medial eminence. If it's kind of more of a chronic bunny and I'm either lengthening my mini bunny incision just a little bit to shave it down um, or or I'm opening it up in, in the Dynabunion just to make sure that you know, the, the prominence isn't there uh, if, if I need to. All right. And uh, what we'll go to last here is basically post-operative protocols. So uh, let's just have uh, each of the panelists kind of go through here, each of our faculty, and just kind of talk about your post-operative protocol for Dynabunion Bunyan and Mini Bunyan. We'll have you go first, Mike, please. Sure. So, um, Post-op shoe, bunion dressing, uh, full weight bearing, trying to keep the weight off the ball of the foot, same for either one. Um, I typically have them come back to the office um, uh, at about a week. Um, at that point in time, I put them into usually a cam boot and I give them a toe spacer. Um, I have them start doing some gentle passive range of motion of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint because um, a lot of the folks are heel walking and they end up with a little bit of a extensor house as long as contracture. Um, but um, at that point, they can start walking. Uh, older folks, softer bone, sicker patients, eight weeks, I let them go out of the cam boot if x-rays look good into a stiff sole shoe. Um, the uh, sneaker, um, if it's uh, younger folks, uh, six weeks. And at that point, if, you know, if the x-rays look good, I'll let them progress to regular weight bearing. Brad, how about you? Yeah, so with the mini bunion, it's uh, weight bearing is to as tolerated right away in a surgical shoe. Um, I try to keep them going slow the first week just to minimize the swelling and then let them kind of go for it. And uh, usually uh, I'm doing about five weeks in the surgical shoe, uh, maybe eight weeks in the, uh, 
you know, six to eight weeks in that ballpark for some of the um, osteopenic or older patients or patients with some, you know, comorbidities that I'm a little bit more concerned. Um, but their weight bearing is tolerated. The Dynabunion, I'm kind of still non-weight bearing for three weeks. And then I start letting them weight bearing the, in the boot for about a month after that. And then, then sneakers. So that's, um, that's been my protocols. Craig. So in my Dynabunion patients, um, they're leaving the OR in a soft dressing and a cam boot. Uh, they're allowed to heel touch weight bear for the first two weeks with an assisted device of their choice until their incisions healed and then they can progress weight bearing is tolerated after the soft tissues are okay up until six weeks. At that six week x-ray, assuming everything's healing well, I'll progress them to their own sandals and shoes. I start uh, both uh, sets of patients on active and passive home range of motion on day four. And um, if I have any idea that they're hesitant to do it or a little bit of post-operative stiffness or fibrosis, I'm pretty quick to get them into physical therapy uh, before there's a problem once their incision's healed. Mini bunion, uh, post-op shoe, weight bearing is tolerated right away, range of motion at four days. Um, typically their own sandal as soon as their pain and um, swelling is resolved. Excellent. Well, at, at this point, I think we've pretty much run out of time. Uh, I want to thank uh, our awesome faculty for all your insight to that tonight. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Everybody have a great evening and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Thank good you night. Thanks, Terry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you to Crossroads as well. We'll have the archive version of tonight's webinar on Foot Innovate, hopefully within the next week or two. So you all will be notified once that is available for viewing. So thank you to our faculty, appreciate it. Good night.